Good morning. I'm Justin. I'm a student pastor here at the Poto campus. We're going to be reading this morning out of uh, Luke chapter 18, starting in verse 18. And a ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know, the commandments do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness and honor your father and mother. And he said, all these I've kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad for he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, how difficult is it for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? For it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of the needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, then who can be saved? But he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And this is the word of the Lord. All right, well, I'm glad to be back with you. Uh, this week, we're continuing our series called Growing in the Gospel. And the hope is that for us, that we can begin to live out the abundant life that Christ Jesus has purchased for us on the cross. And we don't do that through our own um, efforts, but rather we do that through um, coming to know and walk in who we are in Christ Jesus, growing in the gospel. Now, if you're a guest here today, uh, I want to just two things for you. I want to say welcome. We're really glad that you're here and that you've chosen to worship with us. Number two, I need to offer you an apology because today I'm going to talk about money. Now, just a disclaimer, uh, I'm not going to ask you for your money today. Um, if you're a guest, uh, you, know, you don't have to worry about giving. I'm not trying to you know, steal what you got or anything along those lines. Uh, but what I do want to do for both guests and everyone who is here, uh, anyone watching online, is I want to talk about money uh, because Jesus talked about money. Because of all the things that we you know, encounter, the temptations, the struggles that we could have in our everyday life, money seems to be the one that is most prevalent. It's the one that can get us into the most trouble. And so today, I, I, we're going to look into the Word of God. We're going to see a, a man who, um, he was fairly young, uh, because he was close to my age. That means he was young, right? A uh, fairly young guy, and he had some real struggles with money. As a matter of fact, money was the thing between him and a achieving or re recognizing this abundant life that was available to him in Christ Jesus. And so, uh, to tell you how bad this is, uh, this week, and I don't know if this happens to you, but sometimes it happens to me. Um, I was uh, on YouTube. It was a very spiritual time in my life. I was on YouTube, and I'm scrolling through, and there were advertisements. There was a specific advertisement for yachts. And I look at this, and I'm like, oh, my goodness. Like, that looks like the life, you know? Like, it's a, a massive yacht. There's like a helicopter pad and a little boat if you actually want to get near the water. I mean, it, was, it just looked amazing, like the most luxurious thing. And I'm like, man, if I just had, I don't know how many million dollars you have to have in order to purchase a yacht, but it would be several, uh, you know, just to maintain that. I think, man, if I had that, think about the living I could do out there. And then I remembered that I'm um, kind of a redneck guy from eastern Oklahoma, and there's no ocean anywhere around. Probably wouldn't be best for me to, to have a yacht. But that's kind of what happens to us us in our everyday lives as we go out of, of here or leave our homes, uh, there is someone somewhere constantly telling you that you need something. And if you could get that thing, then you would have life and you would be satisfied and life would be perfect, right? And then you get the car and it's, you know, that convertible's nice. And then, you know, kind of cold in the wintertime or it isn't all that you hoped it would be or whatever it is, these things, they don't ever quite satisfy us. And so here's the, here's the thing that you need to know about money or material possessions. Material possessions and money can never solve spiritual problems. And as much as we may attempt to fill our inner void, the inner poverty we may feel, as much as we might try to fill that with material possessions, with wealth, with stuff, it will never satisfy us. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 18. We are going to look at Jesus um, and his exchange he had with the man that's known as the rich young ruler. 
Now, um, we, we don't get all of those details from this text. I'm actually going to borrow a few because we also find this in Matthew and uh, Mark. And so I'm going to steal a few details. Uh, the first thing that I want you to know about this guy is that he was rich. Even uh, the biblical account is going to describe him as extremely wealthy. And so if you would have lived uh, during the time with the rich young ruler, uh, he would have been the guy who had it all, right? He was, his standard of living was far above and beyond anyone else that was around him. He was a high roller. He was a one percenter. This guy had it going on. Now, we don't see it here, but Matthew describes him as a young man. So it's likely that he was somewhere mid-20s to about 40 years of age. He may have even been the same age as Jesus when they have this conversation. So he's rich, and he's young, and then he's described here as a ruler. Um, he was some sort of governing official that would have given him uh, a significant level of power or respect. And so when you think about this young man, he's kind of got his stuff together, right? He's not yet 40. He's already rich, right? He's worked his way up in his career field, whatever it would be, um, some sort of official. He's got some authority. He's pretty powerful as a guy. Um, but another detail you're going to see here in the story is he was also good. And so a lot of times we love to hate people that are kind of rich and successful. You have to think this guy was probably good looking too, right? And you're like, oh, hate guys like that. They have it all, right? And yet for this young man, it seems that he was also virtuous. Jesus is going to have an exchange with him. And he, he, Jesus points him to the commandments of Scripture. And he says, all of these I have kept from my youth. Which means he didn't defraud people to gain his wealth. He didn't step on others to make his way to the top. He must have been extraordinarily intelligent or gifted or something. That he finds himself, he's rich and he's young and he's powerful. He kind of had it all. He was a good guy. You couldn't help but like him. So he comes to Jesus and he opens with a, a rather interesting address. It's, it, he's probably just trying to be polite to Jesus, but he says this in verse 18. He says, A ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Uh, but the address was kind of interesting, and maybe Jesus is kind of using this to, to press into the young man a bit. He said, Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except for God alone. Now, the rich young ruler was a Jew, and he would have understood that, I mean, only God is, is good, and yet he comes to Jesus. Hey, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, nothing else is said about this. Why did you call me good? No one's good but God alone. It's like we kind of leave that there, but Jesus is beginning, perhaps, to challenge this man a bit on um, what is actually good. Why do you consider me good? Maybe he's just getting him to think we're not told here, but the exchange happens. But it gets a, a little bit stranger um, as we look in, into this text because this rich young man, who was a good Jew, he would have understood the answer to his question. I mean, if you weren't even a very good Jew, and you didn't really know, you know, you weren't like a Pharisee, you didn't know all the law, you didn't have all the stuff, even if you weren't a very good Jew, you would have known the answer to this question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And you would have known that if you're going to inherit eternal life, well, you needed to uh, love God and obey the law. You don't do the bad, sinful things, right? And then you, you do the right things. Even if you mess up, you offer the prescribed sacrifices. You observe the Sabbath, you, the, the festival days. You do the good things that Jews do. You obey the law. And yet here is this man who is rich and young and powerful. And he's coming to Jesus and asks a question that anybody could answer. And what this reveals about this young man um, is that he was just like you and me. That this rich young man was suffering from the same spiritual poverty that you and I feel. That as much as he had, there was still something missing in his life. And when he, when he looked in the mirror uh, every day, when he, when he got up, he recognized that there were flaws, that there were defects, there were things in his life that he couldn't deal with. There was something that he was longing for that he was missing that uh, to this point, his wealth was not able to afford him. And so he goes out into public, he finds Jesus, he asks him this question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? 
Of course, Jesus asked him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. And then Jesus points him toward the commandments, but he doesn't list all of them. He's like, you know the Ten Commandments. You're a good Jew. You could quote all these. But then Jesus actually omits a few in the list. He says, do not commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't bear false witness, honor your father and mother. And what Jesus did here is he omitted all the commands that actually had to do with kind of our relationship to God, how we relate to God. And he omitted the command about covetousness. Not included here. Maybe. They're, they're, they just kind of knew that everybody knew what we were talking about. We'll list a few of the commandments, and we know what those are. And, and maybe Jesus left it out on purpose. But the man says to him, the, the rich young ruler says, All these I have kept from my youth. And I've been doing that. And I've been keeping the law. But I'm here because something is still missing. Because it's, I'm, I'm not full. I, I, I still find myself broken and in need. I'm experiencing this spiritual poverty that everyone else seems to feel as well. Jesus, what must I do to inherit this life that apparently only you can give? What do I need to do? Now, it doesn't record it here, but we see it in the other Gospels. It's at this point that Jesus loved this man. We're told that he loved him. And he's going to point him toward the thing that he needed to do if he was going to experience the life of Jesus Christ, the abundant and eternal life. What must he do to experience this life? And he says to him, verse 22, when Jesus heard this, he said, one thing you still lack and of all that you have, all that you've accomplished, I know everybody looks up to you. One thing you still lack, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Hey, go ahead and sell everything that you own. Give it to the poor, but don't worry about it. It's going to be there waiting on you in heaven. You're, you're fine. Don't, don't sweat it. And then I want you to come and follow me. Now, why would Jesus tell this man to sell everything and come and follow him. There's not a commandment in Scripture that we sell everything, right? And you might have heard like Old Testament, there's a tithe. You got 10%. So, you know, you could give 10% to, to God and that sort of thing. But why is Jesus dealing with this man in a unique way? Like, why does he have to give up everything to follow Jesus? I believe it's because Jesus knew that his wealth, this man's wealth, was in his way, that what he had was in the way of what he was truly seeking, that his wealth was keeping him from living the life that he was ultimately wanting to live, but he couldn't see it. This man had been seeking, he'd been trying, he'd, he'd done the things, and he found himself still empty. Now he's asking Jesus, what do I need to do to experience the life that you have? You need to sell it all, and then I want you to come and follow me. Now, it says here that when he heard these things, verse 23, when the man heard these things, he became very sad for he was extremely rich. A very sad um, is, is not probably the fullest meaning sometimes in translating from Greek into English. We just do the best that we can. Um, but this sort of sadness here, uh, very sad, it can mean exceedingly sorrowful. It can mean overcome with sorrow so much as to cause one's death. This is the word that was used when Jesus was sweating drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, if there be any other way, let this cup pass before me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. That's when Jesus was extremely sad. He was extremely stressed. He was sorrowful to the point of death. And that's where we find this rich young man who thought that Jesus, this good teacher, could show him the way to life. And yet he just asked for his money. Now Jesus goes on, he's going to give us a warning that I think is really relevant for us to hear today. Jesus, in seeing, verse 24, seeing that he had become sad, he said, how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Now, this wealth seems to be a barrier that's almost insurmountable, that we, we can't seem to make our way into the kingdom of God uh, with our wealth still in our hands. And he goes on to, to clarify what he means here. He says, For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter into heaven. Now, I'm not sure uh, what explanations you've heard of what it means for the camel to pass through the eye of a needle. Uh, I remember being at church camp when I was a kid, and the speaker was like, well, 
it's not actually like a camel, you know, like full-size camel going through like the little needle like, you know, you saw your mom use or you learned about in home ec, right? Um, but rather, here was his explanation, the eye of a needle was used to refer to the city gate, which, you know, was yay tall. And, a, you know, a man could walk through it without any trouble. But if it was a camel, he would have to stoop to get through the eye of the needle, the gate of the city. And I don't think that's what this means at all. What I, I really think this means is that it is easier for a full-size camel to pass through that little bitty eye of a needle that you and I have seen that you can't get the thread through, right? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to go into heaven. I think what you should hear Jesus saying is this is impossible because look at the response of the people who had heard it. In verse 26, it says, Those who had heard it said, Who then can be saved? If this guy who is rich and he's young and he's powerful and he's a darn good guy, right? He's doing all the right things. He didn't lie or cheat or steal to get there. This guy who's kind of looked upon with some favor by people in our society who keeps the law, if he can't get into heaven, who then can be saved? And Jesus answers them. He says, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Now, do you remember how this whole exchange began? Jesus, what must I do in order to inherit eternal life? Jesus, how do I get there? And Jesus says, it's impossible with man. You can't do it. This won't happen with you, but it is indeed possible with God. Now, before we get too much into that, what you need to know is that money, wealth, treasure uh, is a barrier that often gets in the way from us experiencing the abundant life that Jesus Christ has for us. Um, Tim Keller says it like this. He says, money has a power that is so great that anyone with any money will be blind to the gospel so much that unless there is a direct intervention by God himself, you can't be saved. Anyone with any money, right? When we have a little bit of money in our pocket, you need to know that it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle, through the eye of a needle, than it is for you and I to be saved. It is impossible with man. In order for people with money to come to faith in Jesus Christ, in order for people with a little bit of money to be saved, we need direct intervention from God. We need a miracle. And sometimes, as believers in Christ, we're like, oh, you know, God doesn't care about my money, and it doesn't matter. It's not holding me back. Like, I'm doing great. Like, I'm, I'm living life. Like, I, I can still love God and have money and all these things, and some of that is true, and some of it is us attempting to justify ourselves before God. I think, as the people of God, we need to hear this warning of Jesus, that wealth can get in the way of us experiencing the life that Jesus Christ has for us that our wealth and our material possessions can prevent us from experiencing this abundant life. Now, one of the things that we do when we read this text, and I mean, I've, I've done it too. I don't want to act like I'm somehow more righteous. One of the things that we do is we're like, hey, you know what? That's right. It is hard for those rich people to get into heaven. Like, I mean, I, I would feel that was true if I was rich. But the good news I'm just middle class, right? I'm just a middle class American. You know, I go to work every day, put my boots on, get up early, work hard, make a paycheck, pay my bills, give a little bit to the church. Like, I'm not rich. And so I uh, appreciate the sermon, Jason, but uh, I'm just going to take this Sunday out, right? Not going to take a licking today. Uh, but I think it would be helpful for us to um, evaluate just how much like the rich young man we are. And con consider this. Um, how are we like the rich man? Number one, we are indeed rich and powerful. Now, I can't make us any younger. You know, we are what we are when it comes to our age, but I think we are far more rich and far more powerful than we often give ourselves credit for. So consider this, that our standard of living far exceeds that of the rich young ruler. Think about this. Um, we have surrounded ourselves with more possessions, with more pleasures and more amenities than the rich young man could have even imagined. 
You remember when you were a kid and your imagination was huge and you just dreamed about the world one day and you thought you could fly and all the kind of the big things you dreamed about? This guy in his wildest of dreams probably couldn't have imagined the style of living that you and I get to um, experience today. So consider this. We have, our wealth has afforded us more options regarding the colors and the styles and the types of clothing that we wear than he would have ever had access to. Um, beyond that, uh, our money has given us access to more foods, better quality foods, a better variety of foods than he probably uh, would have ever eaten in his entire life. Um, we have endless options. Well, well, think about this. You're going to have a conversation with a rich young ruler, and you're like, yeah, listen, I don't really have much. I'm not rich like you are. Um, my family and I, the way we do dinner a lot, <clears throat> we, we actually drive up to a window and uh, we just order pretty much anything, you know. We, we first we got to decide where we're going to order from, you know, pick the restaurant, and that's a real challenge for us. But uh, then we drive up to the window and we order anything we want off the menu, and it's going to be wrapped and handed to us out the drive-through window or DoorDash to our place uh, within minutes. It's pretty pretty powerful, right? Or if we feel like we want to go in and sit down, we'll go into a restaurant of our choosing, and that takes some time, and we'll sit down at our table, and we'll browse the menu for all the things that they have, and then we'll pick out whatever it is we want to eat, and in the meantime, there has been a waiter who has brought us our drinks. They set our plates out. They have a napkin and the silverware. Someone else washed that, so we don't have to. They're going to bring us our food after that, offer us dessert, and they're going to clean up everything when we're done. We don't have to touch it. His mind probably would have been blown. Like, you have these options. But it goes, it goes beyond that in terms of us being rich and powerful. Just let's think about our, our houses. Um, we have climate control, indoor plumbing, right? Big plus there. But beyond that, we have electricity at the flip of a switch. We have refrigerators for the things that we want to keep cold and ovens and ranges for the things that we want to make hot. We have vehicles that ferry us anywhere we want to go and shock absorbers so the ride is more comfortable, you know, because we don't want to get too jostled as we travel and, you know, might as well travel in luxury. Um, we have endless entertainment options that we get to consume from the comfort of our home. We have access to world-class healthcare. There's an emergency room uh, when something goes wrong and an ambulance to take us there if we want to go. There's specialists and doctors of a thousand different flavors to help us with whatever might ail us. We have phones in our hands that allow us to con contact anyone, anywhere, at any place in the world, at any time that's there. Um, access to extraordinary amounts of Im information. And yet, having all of those things, most of us in the room have the audacity to think that we have nothing in common with a rich young ruler. Bigger lives, more option, higher standard of living, and we think, oh yeah, I'm not like him. So the first way that we're like the rich young man is that we are indeed rich and we are indeed powerful. The second thing is that we often employ our wealth in an attempt to deal with our inner poverty. You know when it's been a rough day? You know what I do when it's been a rough day? The kids get off the bus from school and I tell them I'm going to take them for a treat. It's, it's for them. And I go get a big old hot fudge sundae at Brahms and I eat and I feel better, right? It makes me feel better that Sunday. Or maybe for you, it's not ice cream. Maybe it's chocolate, or maybe it's a, a ribeye steak, or maybe it's a few drinks after work. But what we do is we use our wealth to mask our inner poverty, to mask the loneliness, to mask the pain, or the disappointment, or the hurt, or the stress. We use our wealth to mask what's going on inside of us. Anybody ever wake up in a foul mood Saturday morning, think, oh, woke up on the wrong side of the bed, and then your conclusion is that in order to fix it, I should probably go buy something new today. I'm going to go shop, and I'm going to go buy something new. I'm going to bring it home and take it out of the box, and I'm going to use it, and I am going to feel better, right? Nobody else does that. Okay, well, that, that's what I do um, sometimes. Um, how about this? Anybody feel safe and at peace in your life, like all is right with the world when there's plenty of money in your bank account? You're like, oh, man, life is good. But then you feel stressed and anxious 
and fearful when the account starts to get kind of low? What we do is what this rich man likely had done. He had used his wealth, he'd used his treasure, he'd used all that he had in order to try to fix what he was feeling inside. He was trying to take his material things in order to deal with this spiritual emptiness. And he comes to Jesus after living a life, he would got the promotions, he achieved the fame, he had the power, he had the money. Jesus, what do I need to do to experience this eternal and abundant life? How do I, what, Jesus, what do I need to do to really live? How do I fix? what I'm feeling inside. And Jesus looks at him and he says, you need to get rid of that money. You need to give it all away. And instead of trusting in and and pursuing after and seeking after money, you need to come and follow me. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to make it into heaven. What thing that if God were to say, I want you to give that to me. What thing in your life would you be devastated if you had to lose that thing? Your retirement account, your career, your status, whatever it might be in your life, that's generally the thing that you're turning to or trusting in to deal with your inner poverty, to deal with a person that you see in the mirror. Maybe it's to make you feel significant, or maybe it's to make you feel worthwhile, or whatever it is, the thing that would be hardest for you to give up is the thing that you're probably using to deal with your inner poverty. So the question that they ask, and it's an important one for us to ask today, is that who then can be saved? Who then can be saved? Well, the gospel of Jesus Christ tells us this. That the radical message of sin and grace and the cross of Jesus Christ, like we have that, like we have the gospel of Jesus because the ultimate rich young ruler gave up his life that we might find true and abundant life. So imagine this, Jesus, he's up in heaven, he's God, he's ruling and he's reigning, he's all powerful, all riches and glory and honor and praise belong to him, right? That's who Jesus was, but that Jesus, he stepped down out of heaven and he gave up his power, he gave up his wealth, he gave up the glory, and he took on human flesh with all of its weaknesses. And he humbled himself here, not to, hey, I'm going to live well, you know, you know, have a couple of kids and, you know, a nice house and, you know, kind of live life pretty well. But I'm going to be Jesus and I'm going to be a good guy. No, no, no. Jesus, he humbled himself to the point of a servant. And he gave his life on the cross that we might find ours. So here is the hope of the gospel for us. That though it is impossible with man for us to be saved, rich people like us, to enter into the kingdom of heaven, because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, the gospel where the ultimate rich young ruler stepped down of heaven, gave of his self, emptied himself of his power and of his riches, because he became a servant and died on the cross for our sins, you and I can be reunited with our Heavenly Father, our Creator. As created beings, there is something inside of us that longs to be reunited with our Creator, to walk in a relationship with Him. And the Gospel tells us that that was made possible by Jesus. So what does it look like for us to grow in the Gospel with regard to our wealth? What it means for us is rather than seeking a life of gaining and attaining, I've got to accomplish this and then I'm going to be, able, be satisfied. I'm going to get this much money. I'm going to buy this next thing. I've got to get the boat, right? I've got to have the truck. I've got to get the husband or the wife or the education or whatever that thing is. Rather than living a life of gaining and attaining, instead, we choose to come and follow after Jesus Christ. Rather than gaining and attaining, we live lives of giving and of serving. Jesus is like, hey, you want to know true life? You want to experience the life that I have for you that is the fullest, most satisfying, most joyful life you can ever live? Man, give up that money and instead you come and follow me. That is the abundant life. The gospel tells us, instructs us that material wealth is never the answer to our spiritual poverty. 
The gospel tells us that there's nothing that we can do to attain this great salvation and the abundant life in Christ. The gospel points us to Jesus and to his work and to trusting in him and following him. Now, the tragedy of this story is that this man went away sad. He wouldn't give up his wealth, the thing that he had, in order to attain the thing that he wanted, which was eternal life in Christ Jesus. And I think the same thing can be true for us. We can walk an aisle and pray a prayer, kind of live out eastern Oklahoma, uh, cultural Christianity, where we, we know the gospel, we, we, we've been raised in church, we know the right things to do, and we kind of live, we, we just settle for living pretty good lives rather than living the life that Jesus Christ died on the cross to purchase for us. That neither wealth nor power, nor fame, nor beauty, or any other thing will ever satisfy our inner sense that something is missing apart from Christ Jesus. So the appropriate response for this rich young ruler, and I believe the appropriate response for us, um, number one, what do we do about our issue with riches? Number one here is give up your wealth. Uh, as, As you look throughout the scriptures, you may be someone who's like, I need to know, what's my percentage? You know, uh, I get Old Testament's pretty clear, 10%. What do I need to give away in order that God will be like, all right, you did good enough, you can kind of have the rest. And that's not the terms on which Jesus works. But in the life of a believer in Jesus Christ, what we understand is that it all belongs to God. Like what we do when we come to faith in Christ is we just write God a big, fat, blank check. And we're like, hey, it all belongs to you anyway. I'm seeking after you. I'm not seeking after wealth. I'm not seeking after possessions. I am going to follow after you. And Jesus, however you want this money to be spent, I'm going to spend it that way. It belongs to you. So uh, when I say give your wealth away. I'm not saying like to me because I need a jet. What I'm telling you is that you surrender to God what already belonged to him. You chase after Jesus. You quit seeking after wealth and you just follow after him. Now, he may bless you with a great deal of wealth, but in the kingdom of God, here's how it works. We take what God has given to us and we sow it into the kingdom of God. Remember the law of sowing and reaping? So we sow those good seeds. We sow what God has given us into the kingdom of God, trusting that he's going to care for us, and that if we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, that all these things are added to us, and we just kind of say, God, it's all yours. I'm going to trust you with it all. I'm going to follow after you. And we trust that he's going to take care of us. We sow those seeds into the kingdom, and we just watch what God does. We get to be a part of seeing people come to faith in Jesus Christ. We get to be a part of seeing uh, poor people uh, provided for. We get to be a part of kingdom work. And Jesus is like, you want to know life? Man, give it away and you come and follow me. You seek first the kingdom and watch what happens in your life. You want to know joy? Give it all away. You want to know joy? Serve just like I serve. You want to know abundance? Man, begin to give to people just like Jesus Christ has given to you. This is how we respond to the gospel. Doing unto other people as Christ has already done to us. So number one, give up your wealth. Man, quit chasing after the empty things and instead surrender it to Jesus Christ. Now, that doesn't mean you have to empty your bank account tomorrow, but rather every single day it all belongs to him. You just do with it as God would direct it. Okay, number two, uh, maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ. You've never come to faith in him. Maybe you think, this is the strangest thing I've ever had or heard. Like I go to church and someone tells me I need to give all of my money away. Listen, what I believe is that Jesus Christ, um, he knows your name, and he loves you deeply. And he wants to lead you to the true and abundant life in him, that the things of this world, material possessions, will never satisfy the deepest longings of your soul, but Jesus Christ will. And Christ, knowing that you were separated from God because of your sin, he went to the cross, and he made an atoning sacrifice. He endured the punishment that you and I deserved that we might be saved and have life in him. And so maybe today what you need to do is just receive and respond to the gospel in faith. The third way that we can respond is that we just begin to follow after him. We just begin to walk day in and day out. Rather than giving our time and our energy and our attention to gathering the next possession, getting the next promotion, hitting the next rung of the ladder, whatever that would be, Instead, we kind of give up the worldly pursuit, and instead, we pursue 
Jesus. Step after step after step. And we just watch how he works through us, how he uses us to build his kingdom. Church, Jesus Christ died on the cross that we might experience this life which is abundant. And for many of us, wealth can get in the way. So I want to encourage you, give it up and follow him. Would you pray with me? Father, we are truly, truly grateful for your word and your spirit. We're thankful for Jesus and for the cross that your blood was shed, that ours didn't have to be. Lord, we pray that we wouldn't just kind of skate through life, you know, living out I don't know, a cheap version of what you have for us via the American dream. But Father, I pray that instead we would live lives as fully devoted disciples who follow hard after you. Jesus, you alone are worthy of our glory and our honor, our praise, our pursuit. So, Father, I pray for abundance for us, for men and women here who are. God, their money has a hold of them. They're in the grips of covetousness. Lord, I pray today for freedom, that you would set them free uh, from the love of money. Instead, they would love you. For the man or the woman here that doesn't know you today, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. For those of us who have been kind of lukewarm followers, I pray that today would be the day that we begin wholeheartedly following after you. And I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.